Hello, reader. I'm Alex. I'm Kelly. And this is the Litroy Podcast. Kim is a writer, book matchmaker, and grad student in creative writing. She shares her best book recs and bits of her writing journey online at Talk Wordy to Me and is a book reviewer for the lifestyle show Good Things Utah. I didn't realize that was a permanent gig. That's kind of fun. Yeah. Like they just, semi-permanent. Yeah. They like to have me on every month. Um, but sometimes I can't, but it is an ongoing gig. Oh, it's kind of fun. We can yeah. talk more about that. Yeah. Kim is a former audiobook narrator, magazine editor, and small press publicist. When she's not working on her next novel, you can find her wrangling her three kids, listening to an audiobook at the gym, or curled up in bed with a BBC drama. Boom. Mm-hmm. Hi, Kim. Welcome. Hi. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Yeah. This is so fun. I don't know if I knew that you were an audiobook narrator. Yeah. I'm all, wait, 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 back up. What? I'll send I know. You Tell some me clips. more. I worked for a small press that did the audiobook narration. And I was like, I think I can do that. And I was working at, when I was at school doing my undergrad, I worked for a radio show and I produced a radio show. And so I had some voiceover experience and I thought, and some acting experience as well. And I'm like, don't those two go together? Totally. And so yeah. I went to them and I'm like, let me audition. So I auditioned. They're like, yeah, sweet. So I, I started uh, narrating audio audiobooks and it, it I don't know if I could do it today because your voice starts to wear out a little more easily mm. like it was hours and hours in the yeah. studio and I was doing the accents too so it was like learning how to do the accents mm-hmm. and all of that so it's a it's a big job but it was fun okay how many accents did you end up having to learn okay so I'm Hungarian is the one that I Hungarian? really had to work on because how often do you hear Hungarian? Yeah, you know, not often. someone said, watch Rescuers Down Under because Bianca, I think was her name, the little mouse. Yeah. Do you guys remember? Mm-hmm. The little white mouse. Oh, yeah. yeah. She's Hungarian. So I just, oh. I watched that movie and then I practiced. And there's also a website. Oh, I don't know if I can remember it. The, the uh, something about, it's an archive of English dialects and you can go and you can listen to every single dialect in the world so I would just listen and listen and practice and get it fresh in my mind right before I had to record it and sometimes I'd be like stop and then I would just practice for a minute and then I would I yeah. would pick up and do it yeah. so that was an accent I had to do English I think that one's fun I feel like that's more accessible um I don't even remember all the, this was in my 20s that was a long time ago <laughs> so, yeah but it was it was fun it was more fun when the book was good Oh, yeah. yeah. But it was enjoyable. I would do it again. In yeah. fact, I'm all, yeah. I have more questions. We'll just do a different podcast about audiobooks because Deal. I'm like, I've never really <laughs> talked to anyone that's done audiobooks before. I'm all, tell me everything. But that is not why we wanted you to come on today specifically, but I'm all, next episode. Yes. Um, today, we wanted to bring Kim on to talk about some really cozy books you can read during the winter months to kind of help yeah. beat the winter blues. Um, I know several people that deal with, you know, SAD, sad disorder, seasonal affective disorder. And um, it's always a struggle to figure out ways, tools you can use to pull yourself up and out of those moments when you are just depressed, you're feeling the blues, you don't want to do the usual stuff and you need something to motivate you. Mm-hmm. And books can absolutely do that. Yeah, I'm like, absolutely. They've done that for me. And so we brought on Kim to help us talk through some of the books that have helped you with that. Yes. And I have experienced sad a lot. And I feel I'm here to say, though, that I think you can overcome it because it used to be I could count on it every single year. And my family knew, you know, and it would I would just go down every winter. Totally yeah. tied to the season. But there have been some things, including some things we'll talk about in these books that have helped me not, I guess, like fall victim to that every mm. single yeah. time the sun goes away. And I think it's important too to kind of note that um, where we live, we live in Utah. And so sometimes our winters can be really long. Like they can yeah. start as early as, you know, the beginning of October and go all mm-hmm. the way into, you know, the beginning of June, just depending on uh, what that year is looking like. And you'll get a few random warm days here and there, but sometimes our winters can just really drag on. And so, I know that a lot of readers out there, that's really similar to them. They have a very long winter season and it's important to find these tools, not necessarily coping mechanisms, but they do help you cope with things that you can't control, like the weather. And so Mm -hmm. um, I think it's an important thing to talk about and to talk about openly Mm -hmm. because I think sometimes people get in a depressive state and they don't realize that it's linked to this like 
inactivity that they have to, they're kind of, you know, like hunkered down in this winter weather, you know? Yeah. And just the lack of sunlight, I think is the biggest thing for Literal me. Literal vitamin D. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Even if it's not super, super cold, just the the dreary, colder days can have a huge effect on your mood. Yeah. That's that's a whole other like health podcast we can dive <laughs> I know. into. I know. Well, I know Huberman on his podcast, he talks about vitamin D and like the first thing he does is he gets up and he gets like, you know, at Go least outside. five minutes of sunlight. Yeah. It's sunlight in your retinas that mm-hmm. makes the difference. Like in the morning and seeing the sunset too at night mm-hmm. can make a difference with your biological clock. So I'm always getting my kids outside first thing if I can, even just 10 minutes and then at night to let them see the sky before it turns dark. Mm-hmm. I don't know. These are little things that make a big difference. Yeah. Well, let's jump into the books because I feel yeah. like I've some of this list kind of goes over some of those ideas. So, mm-hmm. so yeah. let's jump in. First one, wintering. Talk to me about Yay. wintering. Okay. I love this book so much and find myself recommending it to anyone, especially if they live in a place where they experience winter. Catherine May talks about how to lean into the physical and the emotional winters of your life, which we all have. And I like her approach because it's not self-help in the traditional sense where she's like, follow these tips. It can get very didactic. I get sick of self-help really quickly just because I feel like you have to Mm-hmm. You just have to live to learn things. And it is, it can be helpful to hear from other people. And I totally read self-help. But sometimes I feel like it crosses that line of being just a little too down your throat. Like, here, follow these tips and you'll be fine. Yes. The way that she does it, she speaks from experience. She has experienced, you know, deep depression. And she also is on the spectrum. And so she has this experience with being neurodiverse. And she talks about her own story. And then she just gives these really beautiful insights into winter. Like, what if it's not bad? What if your it's your body's way of telling you to slow down? And she gives, the cool thing is she's journalistic about it. So she talks about, and she lives in England, which is always cool. We love England. <laughs> but she she talks about different statistics about winter and what people do to combat you know, the negatives of it. And so she brings in this journalistic side, which really piques my interest because I like to hear about research and statistics and facts. Mm -hmm. But then she brings in the personal experience and she's poetic. She's a beautiful writer. And so it really just, it felt like medicine and it helps you equip yourself with ways to embrace instead of resist the winter. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love that. Yeah. It reminds me, I just, literally this week, saw something, I think it was on Instagram or TikTok, where this woman is walking through these beautiful giant sequoias, you know, like in California. And she's walking through them in the winter and tells the story of how they once experimented with the trees by shooting adrenaline into them, into the root system, to see if it would continue to their growth during the winter season. And within a year, they died because they didn't have the year of winter. Yeah, they and then, didn't have rest. Yes. And so she relates it just, you know, to us as humans. And like, we all need the seasons, even though we might fight against it. We don't want it. It is needed. And it does so much good. And it heals. It slows it down. And it has a purpose. And it really just like touched me. I was like, I needed to hear that this week, you know, because it's just, you get in those moments where you just, in December specifically, you know, just so much to do, things to accomplish, got to get the gifts, got to get the neighbors out neighbor gifts out just so many Mm -hmm. things and so I when I saw that I was like I needed a reminder of that this week and just being in a winter season as a human as a person (laughs) it Mm -hmm. is we all have the seasons and they all have a purpose like nature is so smart and I feel like sometimes we push against nature when in reality I'm like nature's got it all figured out oh well and it we are a product of nature and I think we forget that often that we feel like it's an us them yeah but Life is cyclical on a daily basis, on yeah. a weekly, monthly, yearly basis. And once you can kind of surrender to that cycle, I think that's where you find like more inspiration. I think you're just a happier person when you can surrender to this cyclical nature. And I mean, we talk about this in business all the time. Like our business doesn't need to look the same every day. Like not everyone needs to show up the same way every day. The projects don't need, don't need to be the same every year. Like mm-hmm. businesses also are this living, growing thing. And so we try and encourage our team members to like 
live in those moments of rest, like it's okay if you need to rest. Yeah. Because I think that it helps you to be a more creative person in general. And it helps oh, yeah. you get through. And it, I think it's also okay to kind of sit in in that hibernation a little bit too. But you don't want it to turn into rumination. Mm-hmm. Like you, you don't want it to cross over. And so that's a that's a tricky one, which I feel like the next book actually kind of talks about like how to not ruminate. And I love I love oh, this, this is book. a good one. Yeah. We did yes. But with the wintering, was there any um was there any tips in that book that like stood out to you for like how to winter? Like here's how I would winter kind of a thing, like journaling or anything like that that she brought up. You know, there's a quote. I feel like it's more of a mindset. Mm-hmm. She's it's not very tip heavy because it's not the self-helpy type I was mentioning. Mm-hmm. It's more of a mindset around it and it's mm-hmm. finding your own ways to winter and I definitely have my own ways. I mean, I guess one thing she did talk about is um and now I can't remember if it's in wintering or enchantment her next book. Right. But she does talk about like the cold hot therapy mm-hmm. and she would go swimming in the sea in the freezing cold sea to and and yeah, there's the benefits that are shown with cold water immersion. But I think for her, it was more about challenging challenging herself mm-hmm. and getting out, getting mm-hmm. outside, honestly. I think that was a huge takeaway take is just no matter how cold it is, I can find a good coat. I can put on a hat and I can yeah. get outside because I think sometimes we lean too far into, oh, that hibernation mode, which to a degree, that's great to lean into that during the winter. But if you stay too stagnant, it can really start to take you down into a pit of despair. So yeah. I think just mm-hmm. getting outside was a huge thing, no matter yeah. the weather, yeah. even if it's snowing, even if it's just one quick walk around the block, get outside mm-hmm. when it's darker and colder. Yep. And if if I can, can I yeah. read a quote that I really loved from? Yes, from yeah, the book? Okay. It's a little long, but not too long. Okay. In our relentlessly busy contemporary world, we are forever trying to defer the onset of winter. We don't ever we don't ever dare to feel its full bite. And we don't dare to show the way that it ravages us. An occasional sharp wintering would do us good. We must stop believing that these times in our lives are somehow silly, a failure of nerve, a lack of willpower. We must stop trying to ignore them or dispose of them. They are real and they are asking something of us. We must learn to invite the winter in. We may never choose to winter, but we can choose how. And that's kind of what you were talking Mm -hmm. about, how it's not just the physical winters but it's the emotional winters of our lives Mm -hmm. that there's more purpose behind them than just like oh my gosh this is something that's happening to me and it's bad it's like well wait what is it calling you to do and oftentimes it's slowing down and listening and kind of surrendering surrendering to wherever Mm -hmm. that Mm -hmm. winter takes you you know yeah oftentimes I find too when I go into wintering it's actually because I wasn't living in alignment or like I I wasn't doing the thing that I should that I'm meant to do in that moment in my life. And and I'm so distracted. And so like, I'm kind of forced into this winter season where I let go of things, shed things and create space. Mm. I feel like winter is such a necessary part of um, like spring and, and new growth and new opportunities. And so that's a really, that was a great quote. So should we talk about living Danishly? Yes. Let's I loved, I loved this book. It I thought was, it was great. Too. Okay. Yes. So charming. So charming. And we had I had read it and then we read it for our book club, which was so fun because then yeah, I got to yes. talk with people about it. And it's this journalist that goes and lives for oh, a year. Let's say the title. OK. Oh, yes. Yeah. The, the Year of Living Danishly, Uncovering the Secrets of the World's Happiest Country by Helen Russell. OK, now tell us about Helen. Yes. Yeah, so she's a journalist and she goes to live there for a year and she she escapes a busy hustle focused London in order to go. She's trying to slow down. I think she was trying to get pregnant as well. And no, she was no, having trouble. Uh, her with husband that. got a job with Lego. Oh, that's right. Yeah. I yeah. was like, I remember Lego. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So her yes, husband, yes, yes, so right. she was like, yes, she's pregnant. Yep. She's like, she's like, this will be good for me. I'll start, I'll, yeah. I'll keep, I'll, I'll write a book instead of doing journalism for while I'm here. And I don't even know if she knew she was going to write the book while she was there. But her husband got a job at Lego, so they had to move from London there. And it turned out to be, like, the best thing that could have happened to them. Mm -hmm. Um, So if I remember, the book kind of just goes through what their experience was and what Mm -hmm. they noticed and observed while they were there and comparing Mm -hmm. what they were used to, whether Mm -hmm. it was in 
you know, United States or London. And very fascinating to oh see gosh. how funniest thing the Danish live. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. So it's snowy there a lot. Yeah. There's a lot of fucking snow. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's cold a lot. And one of the funniest things was um, they're really conscientious in their culture of those around them. And um, for example, her neighbors came out and were like, you sorted your bins wrong. And they helped them like sort their garbage properly. But it was like very clear that like that yeah. was the expectation that if you're going to ha- be a part of our community, you're going to be yeah. a part of our community, yeah. <laughs> which I love that part where her neighbors like tell her how to sort the bins. Yeah. Um. But I also I was like, they are very conscientious about quality time with mm-hmm. each other that they spend really intentional time with one another, whether it was at work or at home, or friends coming over, and there was expectations and tradition around this quality time. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm like, what were some of your favorite parts of this book? I mean, we have to talk about Huga because that was a huge part of it. (laughs) And Huga. Huga. I don't know how to... (laughs) I'm close. We did like 20 pronunciations of book club, but is that... About right, <laughs> I think the most success. Huga. A lot of people just say huga, huga, who are American. I think they have a little more like huh going on, like huga. But I, what do, what do I know? I'm yeah. also I'm American. All, you know, <laughs> you've taken the courses on how to say and pronounce it. Oh, that's true. That's, <laughs> that's she's like maybe H- I do. No but it's pressure. Spelled like H Y G G E or Y G G E. Yes. And it someone had suggested this. I think I was complaining about winter, and a neighbor was like, "You just need to look up huga." And I was like, what are you talking about? (laughs) You're like, don't tell me what to do. (laughs) You sneeze. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Why did you say that to me? Is this some crazy new age, you know, thing that we're going to look into? So I look into it and I was like, oh, this is cool. Like it's an actual huge integral part of their culture there. Mm -hmm. And what you were talking about with the gathering and the quality time, it's not only, hey, we're going to get together. They part of huga it's not a huga gathering unless you abide by certain things like we're not going to bring up really touchy subjects here yes we yeah. are going to respect each other's opinions everyone has a voice it's just these like beautiful things that you guys probably implement in your business you know what i mean it, when you're together things like that where it's not just like oh we're going to we're just going to get together it's just very intentional yeah and huga is not just coziness like you can't translate it to an English word, which mm-hmm. makes it so much more interesting and yeah. nuanced. But yeah, that's part of it. That's one aspect. It's the gathering, but gathering in a way that is in the best interest of everyone. And I just love that. I love taking that with me when I go to a holiday party instead of being like, oh my gosh, this is going to be a great break for my kids. Like we went to a couple's uh, Christmas party the other night and that kind of was my mindset. But then I'm like, okay, but also I want to go there and make it a joyful experience for everyone else to to the best of my ability. I want to make it, you know, not just another, hey, we're hanging out and it's not just me gaining something. You know what I mean? So I think the gathering aspect, also Huga talks a lot about light. And I love the idea of bringing more light into your home with Mm -hmm. like fairy lights. Yeah, like candlelight. If I remember right, Candlelight is huge. It's a lot of like ambient, almost like candlelight. And I was Mm -hmm. like, yeah, I love this so much. There is like this really big layer of Huga that is just, aesthetic yeah where it's like comfortable furniture cozy blankets can't like setting a space that is intentionally like warm and welcoming Mm -hmm. which i like is totally my jam i'm i'm a hostess through and through like i love i love welcoming people into my home i'm like welcome i have a lot of weird old lady decor i do (laughs) (laughs) i love it so much and i'm a welcome to my weird hookah (laughs) but i mean it's it, it creates like such a intentional space in yeah. winter and yeah. it's cold there a lot. Mm-hmm. So I, as I said before, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I'm like, I feel like the hugger is, is their really thoughtful way, cultural way of responding to kind of that, that consistent cold weather. And like, how mm-hmm. do we create mm-hmm. reasons to go outside when it's really easy to just be like, I'm sorry, I have to sled if I want to go anywhere. <laughs> You know, <laughs> I remember there was like a, I can't remember the full context, but I was like, they went to a swimming pool. I remember. Yes. Right. And I was like, I can't remember the reasoning behind it. Well, they were all, <laughs> weren't, wasn't everyone naked at well, the pool? Yeah, there was nudity for there's sure. Yeah. Some <laughs> questionable things that you can 
join in on. Yes. <laughs> Questionable for me with my morals, but in like where I'm at, but it it's they have such openness there. It felt like mm-hmm. and there I, is some mm-hmm. yeah, yeah hilarious there, cultural things. Yeah, that yes. she brought so up. So interesting. Yeah. And also like we're all like America's. I would say the like a lot of American culture, and especially if you're like Anglo-Saxon and um, Judeo-Christian lineage coming to America from your immigrant family or ancestry, a lot of it is through the British Isles. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think that there's definitely some like uh, like moral constructs there yeah. that just are totally different than yeah. what you would see in Scandinavia. And so that's been kind of that was one of the funniest parts of the book is they're just like, it's more like your work parties are like, don't ask, don't tell. Yeah, and, yeah. I, was like, what? <laughs> and I was like, okay. <laughs> they keep it fast and loose. <laughs> but it was funny listening to it from the yeah. perspective of a woman who's from England mm. because clearly she comes from like uh, England has like a very they're more uh, conservative, conservative culture, too. Yeah. And so which is really funny. So, yeah, I think that. The main takeaway I took from that and Huga as a general concept is that you can find ways to not resist and combat winter, but to embrace it and lean into it. Mm-hmm. Because I think the mentality is a, is like, oh, let's just go to Cancun, which is great if you can do that. And that's a perfectly acceptable way to deal with winter. Mm-hmm. I'm all for it. But what are some ways that you can lean into what 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 is, you know? Yeah. And so that's what I like. And that that's what helped me with sad and you know feeling better about winter and welcoming it is okay how can i not combat it and escape it but recognize it and respect it for what it is you know yeah yeah i love that it feels kind of pagan a little bit when you look at like (laughs) when you look at like true pagan ceremony and culture it's like beautiful spaces crystals candles nature like honoring the seasons yeah like a like what's happening season like mother earth yeah. mm-hmm. it was really important to how you live your daily life and so that's beautiful i'm like a for hooger yes. let's do a hooger line <laughs> no that feels like a cultural appropriation we won't do that no. <laughs> but you can buy our candles if you want something cozy <laughs> <laughs> It's fine. I'm like the they're Danish, very happy the welcoming people. No, they are happy to share huga with us. And I, I remember it in the book. It talks about like literally how happy they are. Mm-hmm. Like, yep, statistically, yes. And she asked people. She interviewed people on a scale of one to ten. I believe how happy are you, and what would make you happier? And everyone was like an eight at least, from what I remember. Wow. And so it's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. I know. And okay. they and it's so cold, and there's so much snow, like you said. But they're so happy, so we can be too. Okay, talk to us about 84. We'll move on to number three. What's Charing it? Crossroad? Have you read this, Kelly? I feel like no. you have you haven't. For no. some reason, I thought maybe you even recommended it to me. Okay, you need to read it tonight. Oh, maybe right. <laughs> tonight. Okay. It is <sighs> how do I even start? It's this lovely, it's very short. You could read it in a couple hours. Okay. And it's actual letters. This is nonfiction. Oh. Okay. So these are actual letters. Remember when we used to write letters back yeah. before the day of electronics? And this rare, um, this guy owned a rare, what do you call it? Rare bookstore. Yes. A used bookstore. Yeah. And he, in England, on 84 Charing Cross Road, I think it's like a McDonald's now or something, oh. but they do have a plaque. Wah, wah. They have a plaque. <laughs> and he owned this bookstore. And then he communicates with the woman, with a woman who was a writer. And they just kept in touch and she would buy books from him and they just had this charming relationship and she's a witty, incredible writer. So the letters are entertaining and he is this Englishman who is also witty and intelligent and they're just both well read and it's delightful to hear these true real life exchanges between these two book lovers. So I recommend it for anyone who likes books. Perfect. I love that. Okay, I'm going to like, get on that immediately. <laughs> that sounds darling. It kind of sounds like the premise of several books we've read. I know. But I love that it's a real story. It's, it's real. It's true. Real letters. And I don't think they ever met in real life, oh, which really? makes it almost yeah. even more charming. And who was able There's... to collect all their letters? Because yeah, they, they would have been at two different locations. Yeah. yeah. I don't know who kept them and compiled them. That's a good question. I will be researching this. Yes. Later. There's a movie, too, with Anthony Hopkins. <gasps> what? Nice. Yes. Yeah. It's older. Okay. But it's charming. It's, it's called that? 84? Mm-hmm. Charing Crossroad. Okay. Yeah. Cute. Perfect. I know. And it's by Helen Hanf. 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 Mm-hmm. Hanf. Sure. Perfect. We'll put it in the show notes. All these will okay. be in the show notes. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Number four. Devotions by Mary Oliver. 
I love good poetry. And I feel like especially in the winter, poetry can feel just really comforting. It's like a warm piece of toast. I don't know. <laughs> All right. I felt that. I it's really like, like toast. It's like holding a mug. Toast. Yes. There we go. With the steam rising mm-hmm. up out of it. That's how I feel like good poetry is. It can be a form of solace, you know? And I think Mary Oliver is one of our best poets and I just really resonate with her poetry. And this is a great collection. It's a thick devotions is a thick collection of her best poetry over the years. Mm -hmm. And yeah, just read it and thank me later. It's really good. Okay. I will. Thank you. I love it. I love it. We're on number five, which is a book that takes its time by Irene Smith and Astrid van der Host. Yes. Did I do it? Mm -hmm. You did great. (laughs) Okay. A book that takes its time. Tell me about this one. Yeah. I wish I brought it just so I could show you ladies, but it's so pretty. You'll have to look it up. The cover, it's like this. It's big and it has, it's, uh, what do you call it when it's indented on the front? Debossed. Debossed or embossed? Debossed. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. It's debossed. And so you can run your fingers over it. And it's like the, you know, the illuminated manuscripts that have that fancy lettering. And it's, Mm -hmm. it's just very beautiful. And then inside, it's not just a book that a traditional book you read cover to cover. It's almost like an activity book for adults. Mm -hmm. And it's based on mindfulness. So there's these articles about mindfulness that I found really interesting and helpful with tips. And so I feel like it's perfect for like a winter book and combating sad because it gives you practical tips that you can use to be more mindful and feel more happy. But there's also things like journaling prompts and little activities. And there's things you can pull out. Like there, if I remember right, there's a letter you can pull out with a really pretty envelope and send to someone. There's postcards. There's these little gratitude cards that you can put in a jar. There's it's a it's an interactive book. Yeah. And it you just take your time, like the title says, and you take your time flipping through it and uh, reading it and it's just delightful. I feel that's, like it's the perfect That gift. sounds really cute. I was like, that sounds darling. Yeah. Those books are kind of my jam. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember being a little kid and having some of those interactive books and like cherishing them. Yeah. Like I would get them from the books, the, the, um, like the library book fair, or, the or like fair. the book fair. Yeah. And I would just be like, this is my special book. That's but how like, I feel about this one. My kids are not allowed to touch it. Is it like one of those books where you want to buy two? Like you have one that you don't touch and then you have your copy mm. that you're like, I'm going to do no. all the activities. I think you do it. I think you, because the cover <laughs> stays beautiful. You just, you get it and you do it and then you buy two, but you have to give the other one to someone. Uh-huh. I don't think you'd feel good holding on to two copies of this book. It's a very giftable book. So I'm, I should buy oh. three so that I can keep <laughs> my one. Kelly's like, I, I will I'm buy three. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Do you have a, so it, there's like a collection of activities, yeah. but um, is there a lot of things to read in it or is it mostly activities mm. or is it like a good balance? It's a good balance. I would say half Ooh. and half because mm-hmm. there's stories, there's essays, there's no fiction. It's all okay. nonfiction, but there's, yeah, it's like articles and essays, but then there are, you know, little craft activities to do. And one of them I think is just like a timeline of your life. And so you can, that's like one spread, you know, so some of them are shorter yeah. And some of them are longer, but it's a really good variety. But they all have the common theme of mindfulness and slowing down. And I think especially as adults today, we don't do a lot with our hand, like pen and paper with our hands. We're always on our devices. Mm -hmm. And so I love that it takes you off the screen and helps you do something that's productive and meaningful, but without the screen. So I think it can be a really healthy way to, I'm actually trying to, full transparency. I was talking to I have a coach that I talked to and I talked to her today about how to take a break from my phone over the over the holidays so I can be more present with my kids. Yeah. And she gave the tip of putting things around the house that you can just pick up and do for 10 minutes so that visually you have the reminder, hey, I'm going to do this. And I think something like this book and little writing activities and prompts is a good way to do that. So. That's super smart. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, that Great reminded tip. me um, actually, I was listening to an interview with Neil Gaiman from a long time ago. I mean, he looked younger than his master class, so it's been a while. Mm-hmm. And um, and he was talking, he was like, yeah, I, I got a computer. And well, someone asked him about his writing process. And he's like, well, I usually write the whole book by hand. And they were like, what? And he was like, yeah, well, I got a computer. But like, I found that I would be writing and then I'd have a question about a word 
or a replacement word or something like that. And so I rabbit hole into trying to write mm. a perfect novel the first time around, basically. And he was talking about how important it was for him to just get off his computer and he composes his whole novel first. And then he translates it. On, he puts it into a computer and starts editing and things like that. But I just think that there's something um, there's something limiting in a really positive way about not being on a piece of technology because mm -hmm. it forces you to be super present. And yes. instead of the, having this running to-do list of things attached to whatever you're doing right then, I know, for example, every time I'm on Instagram, I bookmark like three to four things. I have thousands of bookmarks because I'm like definitely coming back to that later. I've never, never gone back <laughs> like ever. Me too. But you feel like you're collecting information because information is limitless mm -hmm. online. And so you feel like, oh, there, there's this unrealistic goal that you're going to consume all the yeah. information. And I'm like, actually, you kind of have what you need inside of you. And so what's so nice about putting that phone down is reconnecting with that. Mm -hmm. And so I'm excited. I'm going to get this. That. This feels like... Um, Right book at the right time. Kind well, of thing. maybe Santa heard you and maybe Santa's going to bring it to you. <laughs> I'm Santa. Let me be Santa. <laughs> She's like, don't buy it. <laughs> also, I, last time I checked, it was on sale. And anyway, it's very affordable for what it is. I'm like, we'll what? put an How affiliate link to it. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> anyway, yeah. but I loved what you said and about writing by hand. And so I used to um, help run a journaling company. And so I did a lot of research on. What's the difference between writing with your hand versus typing, you know? Yeah. So you're speaking my language because there's there's a psychotherapist named Maud Purcell who talked about this. And mm -hmm. she said, scientifically, when you're writing by hand, it quiets the monkey mind because it's taken up, it's focusing on writing. Brilliant. So you have that motor activity of using your hand to put pen to paper. And while the monkey mind is occupied, that opens up the right side of your brain, which is your intuitive side of your brain, and it allows you to be more creative and to access more original ideas. And so I get why Neil Gaiman does that. And I'm trying to do more of that, too, in my own writing, because it really is a different experience. Mm -hmm. And obviously, there's I type, too, and that's efficient and all of that. But I've been writing a lot more by hand because you can tap into your subconscious and tap into that right brain flow. Yeah. So there really mm -hmm. is something to it. And then there's the whole thing of journaling and, and kids. You know, I love having my kids journal because it helps them quiet their monkey mind and they're on screens plenty. And mm -hmm. but and being able to slow down and put that pen to paper, it really can be a healing process for anyone. You don't have to be a writer or Neil Gaiman to do it. Yeah. yeah. I love it. Yeah. Okay. Should we transition into fiction? Yes. Oh, yes. The last five books, I don't know if we specified, what are nonfiction yes. All non suggestions? Mm hmm crossing the line over into fiction now mm -hmm. let's start with number bum, bum. six all the lonely people by mike gale yes i, I if i've read this one yeah i'm curious i don't know i haven't read this one i've i've definitely heard about it yes if i haven't i if you liked a man called uva you'll mm. love this this oh, I man love that book oh, yes. he's so lovable his name's hubert bird and he has these weekly calls to his daughter who's in australia and he's living alone and he, Here's the thing. He makes up this whole life that he's living because she's so worried about him living alone that he's like, oh, yeah, my friend. I forget their names. But he's like, oh, yes, my friend Charlotte and and her husband. And, and I mean, they're real people, but that he's totally lost touch with. He's become really lonely because he hasn't kept up with these relationships after his wife died. You know, he got really sad and lonely, which is something that's not uncommon for older people when a spouse dies. And. But then he receives some news and his daughter's coming for a visit. So now he has to make his real life resemble his fake life that he's been talking Amazing. to. Amazing. <laughs> it's like real reality versus this fake one. <laughs> and so he has to kind of come out of his shell a little bit. And it's just, I feel like it's a universal message because it really taps into the loneliness epidemic that we face and the disconnection that we face amongst so much connection, yeah. you know, with our phones and technology. And I just felt like it was a really beautifully told story that resonated in that way. Yeah, just delightful. Really good to listen to. If I remember right, he has a Jamaican accent. And so it's fun to listen to. And one of the best books I've ever read. I would recommend it to anyone. Okay, nice. I have a great TBR list after this. I'm very excited. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, that sounds amazing. And um, it kind of reminds me, there are a few feel good books like that out there that um, kind of focus on creating real human connection. Mm. I know that, that that's kind of the premise of m- most fiction. Um, but I think it's super important. Um, one thing I find is... I, I really believe that people online who get in these negative headspaces where they're just like, they're like bonding with each other over mutual hatred. Mm-hmm. They're like bonding with strangers and it feels like bonding because they're lonely. And so any kind of connection feels like real connection, but there is such thing as, as like a toxic connection. Like trauma bonding is, is something that is so easy for us to fall into, you know, and Mm -hmm. making these connections based on like these negative experiences, like this, this mutual hatred or this mutual anger. And, um, and I think that to some extent, you know, when you're facing injustice, that it's okay to be upset with injustices. I, I think it is absolutely okay to feel like these moments of, fear or frustration with things happening in the world. But I do think that there's also something so fundamental to humans about connecting in genuine, like, connection and space with each other, like connecting in person with each other, connecting in just joy of life, like having Mm -hmm. a great meal together. Mm -hmm. There's something that is so fundamental to our nature as as animals that we need to connect and that we need to do it in the same room and that we need to do it around, you know, food and positivity. And I think that's why people are so lonely is because it's really easy to fake connection when you are online. Yes, and easier than ever. It's so easy. Mm-hmm. And, and you're telling yourself that that's all you need, but um, but a lot of people have, you know, a lot of it feels really high risk to connect with others. And so mm-hmm. I love books like this that kind of teach you that you're like, you know, people in circumstances that you can relate to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It kind of gives you a roadmap on how to be brave and make that in-person connection. Yeah. I That makes me think of the Surgeon General's actual research and statistic about loneliness and how being lonely and not having strong social connections is as bad for you as packing a, sorry, smoking a pack of cigarettes every day. It might have been more than one pack. It might have been okay. two packs, but at least a pack. Right. Wow. So it just so affects like it your, affects heart, your physical your health. Mm-hmm. Yes. And to your point, it really is our biggest need as humans. And as I, as I live life and think about um, things that I struggle with and my friends struggle with, it a lot of it comes back to that deep innate need to belong. And so I just, mm-hmm. yeah, to I'm just agreeing with you that books like that, that remind you to pursue real connection. Yes, I that just totally sparked. I watched, oh, now I can't remember who, but I was watching a podcast and listening to it. And the guests that they had on had written many books about how to prolong life and things that can help make you live longer, basically. And her most recent book was the one that surprised her the most because she had written many books about how like exercise and meditation, things like that are so important to help live a longer life. And then her recent book, she said, I was very shocked to discover in all my research that the number one predictor of a long, the number one predictor of a longer life is human connection. It is connections. And it doesn't have to be like the best friend that you've had since high school. She's like, it can literally be going into a coffee shop, talking to a barista and forming a connection with them in that Mm -hmm. way. But when you isolate, when you have less people in your life, when you're not getting out, that absolutely affects the longevity of your life. Yeah. So I was just like, good to know. I, I actually, I just saw a, a podcast. Oh, we're good. Okay. I just saw, um, a, not a podcast. I saw a TikTok yeah. where they were talking about, um, uh, there was two different ones. One was talking about how people like miss college. Um, and, yeah. and, and, um, and the guy was saying, like, I don't I don't think you actually miss college. I actually think you miss community. community. And uh, in the same note, there was someone else, a different TikTok. I love TikTok. This is everything you hear on TikTok's real, guys. <laughs> no. Um, but I love the point this other TikToker made where he was saying that um, in other countries, people have a third place. Mm-hmm. They have a first place, which is their home. They have a second place, which is usually their work or school. And then they have a third place, which is like their local coffee shop or their local pub. 
um, where that's where they make human connection. And, Mm -hmm. and that's where they're like, I am a part of a bigger thing. Mm -hmm. What is really dangerous about just only being online with your connections is that you lose sense of scale. You feel insignificant and also like feel like the most significant Mm -hmm. simultaneously. And you, Mm -hmm. you, Forget that like you are a cog in a bigger machine, but also it doesn't have to be like this like horrible minimizing thing. It's actually like a community that you're a part of and what you do matters in that community. Mm-hmm. And I kind of have this dream that Lit Joy someday will open up like a storefront bookshop, coffee, cafe place because I'm like, I want there to be a third place. But it's mm-hmm. really hard to do that in America because yeah. America was built for cars and car sales yeah. like that's how like everything is so spread out people aren't mm-hmm. walking right you know it's yeah. much larger unless you're in like these little towns in new yeah. england new england is a good place yeah well and even yeah. just in utah there's a place called daybreak which was mm-hmm. designed to be a walking community mm-hmm. and they have every socioeconomic status like within daybreak so they have small p- apartments all the way through mansions that mm-hmm. are all walking distance mm-hmm. and i'm like that is the utopia of like third place and community that you do see a lot of the time in European countries or mm, yeah. South American countries. But, you know, it's it's tricky to have um, to have that where we live. And mm-hmm. and so but I think that's why I started a book club. I know <laughs> it's our third place. That's what it's I thought when place. she said third place. I was like, it's delicious reads. It's yeah. Yeah. totally. Yeah, that's it's always so big. It's so much more than a book club. Yeah. I would recommend too to readers if you're in the middle of uh, you know seasonal depression or you're in this low, um, even if you can't do it this year, when you're feeling better in the spring summer, start a book club. I'm like, we'll do. I know we have a couple episodes coming up where we'll talk yeah. about like the best books to start a book club with. But I mean, it just I know when I joined book club, none of the women really had jobs, and we're mostly just full time moms. And from book club now. All of them have careers. It has created opportunity for them. Once their kids went to school, they like blossomed into like all these different things. Yeah. And so it it created like expansion Mm -hmm. to have Mm -hmm. a third place, which Mm -hmm. I love. I'm all all about starting clubs in general. Like I'm always going to promote a book club, but I've been in a culture club. I've been in a dining club. Like Mm -hmm. I'm like, what else? Travel club. Did you start clubs when you were little like I did? Yes. Okay. I'm not surprised at all. At all. <laughs> I feel like it's a way to keep doing that, yeah, you know? Yeah. So creating any sort of club where it, if it's really intimate with just like your besties first or, you know, you open it up to your neighbors or other people yeah. that you may not even know yet. It's just a great way to create your own community of that third mm-hmm. place. Mm-hmm. And, and sometimes it's better if you don't know them. Yes. I'm like, because with your best friends, there's like not as much accountability Uh, for like a book club or to like get something going or, you know, because like best friends, there's a level of comfort there that you're kind of like, yeah, I can't make it. And it's like, yeah, don't worry about it. But what's really kind of wonderful about expanding your circle to new people is I think it pushes you out of your comfort zone a little bit and it creates like opportunity for expansion and growth and and like hearing perspectives that are different than Mm -hmm. yours. That's one of my favorite things about book club is a lot of those women I only see once a month. Mm-hmm. but I like that I get different perspective every single time. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Well, and for me, some of the huge value has been reading books I wouldn't normally choose for myself, Yeah, you know? And so I think, I mean, I feel like Delicious Reads really opened up the world of fantasy to me, which is huge, and I love it. I love a well-written fantasy, and so I think that's another huge value is just not just staying in your own bubble of these are the books I read, you know? Yeah. yeah. I think that's really important to read, you know, widely and diversely. So that's a really big value point. I have a whole blog post on how to start a book club, but I do think you guys should do a podcast episode on that because cool. people get hung up on that, right? It's yeah. Yeah. especially where a lot of us book people are a little introverted. Yeah. And so it can be really daunting to think of how the logistics of how to start Mm -hmm. it and how do I find people and how do I make it about the book and not just like, let's get together and not read the book and just get Mm -hmm. together, which is fine too. It's just a different goal. Well, a lot of times I think like, it'll be like, let's together and get together and, and like 
talk about the book when they really mean drink wine, <laughs> you know, like yeah. that's definitely I've had a couple of people say like, well, everyone came and brought wine, but nobody read the book. So um, that's a good idea. Maybe we'll do a couple episodes about doing a like how to do a book club and, and maybe some free downloads. Yeah. So that to. people can have like something to take note on. Yeah. Another just last yeah. tip for that. If it's too daunting to right away start a book club, I think doing a book swap to begin with can be yeah, a really a fun idea. way to get into it because there's no smart. pressure. You just bring a book and you swap and then you have your people there. And then yeah. you can say, okay, hey, next month, same time, same place. <laughs> Especially if people talk about the books that they yeah. love, then other people are like, yeah. oh, I want to read that. And maybe yep. they'll be kind of like a front runner. Mm-hmm. That would be, that's a really good suggestion. Okay, we got to go, I'm like, on to the next one. Yeah. Um, the Storied Life of A.J. Fickery by Gabrielle Zevin. I mm-hmm. just watched the movie of this. Oh, it's so good. I it's didn't so realize charming. that it was a book first. I know. It was really cute. It had um, Lucy Hale, Lucy, I don't know. She's don't the really cute yeah, yeah. one with the dark hair, dark hair, big mm-hmm. lips. Mm-hmm. She's like, she's Snow beautiful. White. Yes, mm-hmm. 100%. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh my gosh. I watched it on the airplane because I didn't realize it was a movie. Me too. <laughs> Did you? Yeah. Oh my gosh. It was so charming. It yeah. was adorable. And I think the book is, they're both really well done. I okay. love it. That's, that's good. A, that's another episode of books yeah, to books movies. To movies. <laughs> we literally have that on the list. I believe it. <laughs> yeah. So I feel like this is one where they were both really, really good. And it's just a charming, one of those charming stories about a bit of a curm- curmudgeon who's been jaded by life and lives on his own and then someone comes in to change all that, right? Yes. So it seems tropey, but it's not written tropey at no. all. It's very unique and really beautifully written and unexpected. The yeah. plot is unexpected with some of the things that come up. And I just really like it. It's a very cozy yeah. read. Sounds so there like, is, oh, go ahead. Oh, like, it just sounds like a ray of sunshine, right? Mm. That kind of a book. Yeah, there are some, you know, deeper parts to it, but nothing like ultra depressing or anything. It's yeah. still very cozy and inspiring, uplifting. And he owns a little like kind of like a little bookshop that d- only sees tourists every now and then. And mm-hmm. you yeah. have to take a ferry across to get the to water it to get to it. So it's very quaint. It is. Yeah. It was really sweet. I, mm-hmm. I enjoyed it. And I would, I'm excited to hear that it's a book. I just assumed it was a book after I watched the movie. I was like, that was a booked movie, yeah. but I was on the flight to a yeah. trip. So I just like, it went in and out of my head. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, Okay, The Book of a Thousand Days by Shannon Hale. So I brought this one up because a lot of people have, or maybe not a lot of people, but I feel like more people have heard of Goose Girl than Book of a Thousand Days. That's a more popular one of her books. But I had a personalized reading recommendation from a librarian, which that's amazing. Wow. Yes. That's that's, amazing. I swear that's how I got into reading again as an adult. I was working as a reporter and I went, I had to do a, I got to do a story on books. And so I went to the librarian and I learned that they did this. They still do it, I think, at Provo Library at least. Um, and I'm sure a lot of libraries around the world do I this. I just feel like probably genius, a lot of librarians but, like like us are like, let me tell you what to read. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like when, oh, you, yeah. when you love a book, like one of, I love to personality diagnose people to like what book they'd love. Yeah. Kelly's really good at that. It's a special skill. It's it's a bibliotherapist. It's a real thing. Oh my gosh. Yes. I need a new career. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, Kelly, your future life. is calling. Yeah. Second half of my life. That's what I'm doing. Yes. What is it called? You'd be so good. A bibliotherapist. Yes. Yeah. This is great. Yes. Really is. So these personalized reading recommendations, I feel like it goes even deeper than just saying, oh, help me find a book because it's a whole survey. You answer all these questions so they can get to know what you've liked, what you haven't liked, what you're looking for, what your comfort level is with content and all this stuff. Anyway, so this book came out of that and it's about a young girl. I think it's uh, technically a YA book and she or maybe even middle grade, but she gets locked up in a tower because she didn't marry who she was supposed to marry. And that's, anyway, that's basically the premise, kind of like a tangled situation yeah. or Rapunzel. But it's just, it was a really well-written, interesting story. So is this considered middle grade, young adult? Exactly. I don't know if it's middle grade or YA, but it's the same as Goose Girl, which I think is middle, technically middle grade. Yeah. middle grade. So yeah. yeah, it's middle grade. I do love a good middle grade though. Like, yeah. There's, oh yeah. They're and just some of the best stories. I am really, really picky about middle grade reads, and this is one of the few I love. Yeah. So, yes. Shannon Hill's it. incredible. Mm. I love her as an author. Yeah. So. And if you have kids or teens, it's totally clean and a great read for them, too, or okay. read aloud with them. So, I love it. Nice. Okay. We'll move on to number nine, which is What the Wind Knows by Amy Harmon. Yes. Amy Harmon is one of my all time favorite authors. 
And if you like time travel, yes, this is I, <laughs> immediately. Yes. Yeah, I didn't even finish the sentence. <laughs> yes. Did I say that out loud? <laughs> I knew it. I knew you'd like this. This one is so good. She is incredible. She also wrote um, Where the Lost Wander, which is a really great book about well, we were not talking about that book. We're talking about What the Wind Knows. It's <laughs> set in Ireland. And we love an Irish Should have led with that. Actually, I I, Irish time travel. I feel like you Irish got me. time travel. Yep. I don't know if I need to say anything else, but it's a really lovely book. I'm all, yeah. Okay. <laughs> then <laughs> take me away. Okay. Yeah. That's all right. Great. Last one, 10 by one of your favorite authors, Kate Morin, The Forgotten Garden. Yes. I was this like, is a good one. This is a. To me, it felt like a very dark fairy tale vibe to it, mm-hmm. kind of a Wuthering Heights vibe to mm-hmm. it, slash Jane Eyre, like yeah. that, that yes. creepy, the moodiness. moody, mm-hmm. like garden, English garden, marshes kind of vibe. Yes, mm-hmm. yes. And that's the thing with Kate Morton. She's a very atmospheric writer. Mm-hmm. So if you love to feel transported and if you love a rich setting, yeah go to Kate Morton because her settings are alive. They're Mm -hmm. like a character. And she writes historical mystery, which I feel like is a very niche genre. And she does it so well. She's a master. I also found her from that same recommendation from that librarian. Here's the thing, though. I started reading the novel. It's a big one. It's a chunky one. Most of Kate Morton's are. Yeah. Yeah. And I started reading it and I was like, I can't. And I put it down. But while I was reading it, my sister-in-law asked me what I was reading and I told her. And then next time I saw my sister-in-law, she said, thank you so much for telling me about that book. It was amazing. And I was like, oh, I put it down. Okay. So I'm going to go pick it back up. And I ended up loving it and it's in my top five. Yeah. So, Mm -hmm. you know, it really, what you like to read really just depends on your mood at the time. I know. I was just telling Kelly that, that I was like, I'm kind of not loving Iron Flame. Mm-hmm. And I think it's because of where I'm at. Yeah. Because when I read Fourth Wing, I was like, this is so fun. Like, this is yeah. such a fun book to read. But right now I'm kind of like, this feels really shallow. And then, I'll, oh, maybe that means I need to pick up something more, more like deep. more like Kate Morton right yes. now mm-hmm. and then come back to yeah. Iron Flame. Yeah. Because it's so often books find us when we need them, yep. not necessarily where they fall on our like TBR list. Totally and so, agree. Yeah. And also goes to show to get to, I don't know what you guys do, but I will give a book 50 pages. Sometimes I don't give it that much, but if I'm on the fence, I'm like, okay, we get to 50 pages and then I decide. Mm -hmm. I don't know how far I got in this one, but I think, you know, having like kind of a general limit of when you say, okay, there are too many, too many fish in the sea, too many books on the shelves to waste my time with something that's not pulling me in. But I'm really glad I went back to this one because I love it. I I do warn people when they read Kate Morton, I'm like, Give it like a hundred pages. Her, you need more. Yes, yes. hers are like lengthy, a, mm-hmm. and definitely she will s- set something up that it's a little slow going in the beginning, but it's always so worth it. It's so rich, always worth it. Yes. And this one I really love of hers. It you go through three different time periods as well. Yeah, so you get three different stories that interweave, mm-hmm. and by the end, at least for me, I was like, whoa, I don't know if I saw that coming, mm-hmm. and all of that was needed. Even yes. though it was a little slow in the beginning, but yes. loved this book. She yep. always surprises me. It's and my it's favorite yeah. I've read of hers. It's my favorite yeah. of Kate's. Mm-hmm. Oh. It's really beautiful. I love her very much. Big fan girl. Nice. Well, I think that that's, that's our top 10 to read this winter season. Yeah. Kim, thank you so much for coming on. You're welcome. Thank you so much for tuning in to the LitJoy podcast for this episode. Please remember to rate and review us. It helps us to keep doing the podcast and we love being a part of this community. And like a good book, don't forget to recommend us to your friends.